And welcome again to the Study Bible Bible Study, where we study the Bible with Study Bibles. And Revelation 17, 14 tells us, And these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall conquer them, for he is Lord of Lords, he is King of Kings. And they who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And we're going to go into a Wesleyan study of First Thessalonians chapter 4. Chapter 4, I believe it's 13. 413 to probably all the way to 5. This is a Wesleyan study of it. This is a very popular, popular verse, this Thessalonians 4. Now Romans 8, 35 tells us, And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted for as sheep for the slaughter. But nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor depth, nor height, nor any other creature should be able to separate us from the love of God which is in and Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, God bless and amen. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 of our Wesleyan study. Now, problems concerning the future. Now, the Apostle Paul now, the Apostle Paul always insisted upon an intelligent church membership, and again and again in his letters we find some such phrase as, We would not have you ignorant, brethren. Now, men must be saved from ignorance as well as from past sins. At this point, Paul could speak out of personal experience. He himself says he was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Now, while mistakenly assuming that he was doing God's will, later he confessed to his shame, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, Paul knew full well how dangerous it is, how dangerous it is, a ah, pious zeal that is directed by an untaught mind. In this paragraph, he wants the church to be saved from ignorance, especially with the respect to the state of the dead and the time and the circumstances of Christ's return. Now some of the Thessalonians were misinformed and they were confused, almost to the point of despair. If Christ had already returned, as some alleged, as some alleged, what has become of our departed loved ones and what will become of us? The paragraph now before us is manifestly not designed to give us a complete system of eschatology. The paragraph now before us is manifestly not designed to give us a complete system of eschatology, a complete system of what's going to happen in the end times. It's not a foretelling of the end times, or at least not a complete and, complete and clear view, cut and dry clear view, as some would say, or purport. Now its purpose is rather to reassure anxious believers concerning the divine order of the events when Christ actually does return. Now the state of the departed saints, Article 1. Now, but we would not have you ignorant brethren concerning them that fall asleep, that you sorrow not, even as even as the rest who have no hope. The rest that have no hope would be the pagan non-believers, I believe. Now, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also that are fallen asleep in Jesus Christ will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we that are alive, that are left unto the coming of the Lord, shall in no wise precede them that are fallen asleep. Now for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. And the dead shall, in Christ, shall rise first. 
that we, then we that are alive, that are left, shall together with them be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Kind of sounds like a little part of that piece from uh, the teachings of the Twelve Apostles that we did a series on a few series back, I believe. Okay, now, Thessalonians had but recently come up out of a paganism, out of paganism, out of the paganistic society that offered no hope for the future into a faith assured them not only of immortality but also of eternal felicity and union with Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, such a prospect was eagerly embraced by these young Christians who found themselves ostracized and persecuted by the world. Notice, therefore, Paul's view of death itself, them that fall asleep, not extinction of being, but blissful repose, comparable to the rest of sleep at the close of a day of toil. Is the, is the view held by the Apostle. Contrast this with the gloom and despair of the pagan world as found in this ancient writings and especially in the inscriptions of the tombs of the early centuries. Now then notice the evidences of hope that faith has engraved upon the Christian tombs and the catacombs and the Apostles reminds the anxious Thessalonians of faith which guarantees hope and assurance elsewhere. He reminds us of Christ, our Savior, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, is it Christ's resurrection that assures us of eternal life and felicity? And hence, we with Paul may view death as a mere falling asleep, as a resting from earthly toil, as a returning home in the evening. Now death is like a sleep which implies continued existence in a state of repose. Now the word ignorant is derived from the same root as agnostic, not knowing, and to emphasize the continuity the continuity of life, the continuity of life. Now after death, the verbal phrase fall asleep is present participle. Them who are from time to time are fallen asleep. Now the problem with Thessalonica was not an outright denial of the resurrection as it was at Corinth, as later in 1 Corinthians 15.12 look at that look at that passage later nor was it heresy such as one taught by Hymenaeus and Philetus who insisted that the resurrection is already past in 2 Timothy 2 17 and 18 it was rather a misapprehension of the chronological relation of the resurrection of the saints to the appearing of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now Paul proposes to correct this misunderstanding by a plain statement of the truth relative to the Lord's return. Now first of all, as we have observed, he clarifies the Christian view of death. Once we know what death is and what it cannot do, once we know and understand what death is and what death cannot do, that death can no longer affect us, those who are with Jesus Christ. Then Paul describes the Christian's proper attitude towards the incident of death. Sorrow not, even at the rest, who have no hope. Nowhere does Christian faith shine with greater radiance than the death chamber or at the graveside, or contrawise. Nowhere is the man of the world more helpless than in that awful hour when he finds himself alone and face to face with God in the time of in our time of judgment when we stand before him now paul evident <clears throat> now paul evidently recalls the excessive grief commonly demonstrated by the jews as well as the utter despair of the pagans when counsel grief when counsel when he counsels grief stricken believers that ye sorrow not even as the rest who have no hope now some of them may still have followed formerly 
their former funeral customs, either as pagans or as Jews, but Paul frankly admonishes them to behave like the believing ones in the presence of death. He warns them not to yield to the hopeless and excessive grief as do the heathen. Now anything resembling pagan sorrow and by inference pagan funeral customs is not to be followed by Christians. The believer walks through the somber shadows poised and sustained by faith in him. Whoever lives and who is ever present, the pagan has no such faith, hence he can only grope through the gloom clutching at his, clutching at as it clutching as it were straws and shadows, reaching for nothing but hopelessness. The pagan has no such faith, hence he can only grope through the gloom. Now the Christian, by contrast, exhibits the reality of his hope in the presence of death. In the following verse, let us carefully follow Paul's train of thought. His argument is somewhat as follows. Do you, my brethren, believe that Jesus Christ died and arose from the dead? Of course you believe this. This is our foundation. This is what we teach and preach, and this is what we stand for, and this is the gospel message that Christ died and rose from the dead and paid the redemption, the price which we all owe for death. For the wages of sin is death. Now very well, continues Paul, for whom did Christ die and rise again? For you, of course, and for all you who truly believe in him. Now dying for you and arising from the dead on your behalf, it must become clear that he has identified himself in death and in life with you and for all whom he died arose again. Believers are therefore identified with Christ in death, for beyond death, in the resurrection of life forever and forever. At the moment an impassable gulf separates the living believers from their departed loved ones, but no such gulf exists between Christ and the saints who now live in his presence. Indeed, Paul affirms that them also that are fallen asleep in Jesus Christ will God bring with him in the appearing of Christ our Lord. This is our first Wesleyan study of Thessalonians chapter 4, 13. This is the study Bible, Bible study, where we study the Bible with study Bibles. And Romans 8, 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted for as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, I say in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Revelation 17, 14 tells us, And these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall conquer them. For he is Lord of lords, he is King of kings, and they who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. God bless and amen.